ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ما بعد so Allah willing we will explain page 160 the story of prophet Thamud Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem wa ila thamud akhahum saliha qala ya qaum a'budullah ma lakum min ilahin ghayruh qad ja'atkum bayyinatun min rabbikum hadhihi naqatullah lakum ayah فذروها تأكل في أرض الله ولا تمسوها بسوء فيأخذكم عذاب أليم واذكروا إذ جعلكم خلفاء من بعد عاد وبوأكم في الأرض تتخذون من سهولها قصورا تتخذون من سهونها قصورا وتنحتون الجبال بيوتا فاذكروا آلاء الله ولا تعثوا في الأرض مفسدين قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه للذين استضعفوا لمن آمن منهم أتعلمون أن صالح مرسل من ربه قالوا إنا بما أرسل به مؤمنون قال الذين استكبروا إنا بالذي آمنتم به كافرون فعقروا الناقة وعتوا عن أمر ربهم وقالوا يا صالح أتنا بما تعدنا وقالوا يا صالح أتنا بما تعدنا إن كنت من المرسلين فأخذتهم الرجفة فأصبحوا في دارهم جاثمين So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates to us the story of Prophet Salih عليه وعلى نبينا الصلاة والسلام uh, Allah says, and to Thamud, the people of Thamud, we sent their brother, Salih, from among them. He said to them, O oh, my people, worship Allah alone. You have no other God worthy of worship except Him. Indeed, there has come to you a clear sign from your Lord. This she of Allah is a sign unto you. So leave her to graze in Allah's earth and do not touch her with harm, lest a painful torment should seize you. And remember when he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made you successors generations after Ad and gave you habitations in the land. You build for yourselves palaces in plains and carve out homes in the mountains. So remember the graces bestowed upon you from Allah and do not go about making mischief on the earth. The leaders of those who were arrogant among his people said to those who were counted weak among his people, to such of them as believed, because not all the weak people believed in him. So the leaders told the weak believers, do you know that Saleh is truly sent from his Lord? The weak believers said, we indeed believe in that with which Saleh has been sent by our Lord. Those who were the disbelieving arrogant chiefs said to the weak believers, verily, we disbelieve in that which you believe in. So they killed the she-camel and insolently defied the commandment of their Lord. And they said, O Saleh, bring about your threats if you are indeed one of the messengers of Allah. So the earthquake seized them and they lay dead, prostrate in their homes. Thamud, their land of their lineage. The scholars of tafsir and genealogy say that the tribe of Thamud descended from Thamud Bin Athir bin Iram bin Sam bin Nuh, because as we said before, Nuh alayhi salam is the second second father of humanity. Everyone that exists today is from the lineage of Nuh alayhi salam. Only Nuh alayhi salam and his progeny were allowed to procreate in the land. Even the believers that with Nuh alayhi salam, they did not have any progeny left. It's only Nuh alayhi salam that Allah allowed him and his progeny to thrive 
in this world. So everyone that exists today in the world is a descendant from Nuh salam. So uh, they are the people of, of uh, Thamud, they are uh, descendant they are the descendants of Thamud bin Athir bin Iram bin Sam bin Nuh and uh, he is the brother of Jadis son so Thamud is the brother of Jadis who was a son of Athir similarly the tribe of Tasim and uh, so basically Jadis is the father of the tribe of Tasim and they were from the ancient Arabs Al Ariba, Al Arab Al Ariba, as opposed to the Arabs that came from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam, they are called Al Arab Al Musta'riba because they were not Arabs, they just learned Arabic and dwelt among the Arabs. So they are from the Arab Al Ariba before the time of Ibrahim, and Thamud obviously came after the people of Ad. So the uh, tribe of Thamud dwelt between the area of the Hijaz, Western Arabia, and Asham, Greater Syria. Uh, they actually today the the their ruins still exist today in uh, Saudi Arabia. It's called Mada in Saleh. You can still actually you can just Google uh, the, how their uh, how their dwellings look like because as we will see, the Prophet ﷺ said that we should not enter the 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 the, uh, the homes of the people who were cursed and destroyed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, except if you are crying out of fear and humbleness from Allah's might and uh, and uh, revenge upon disbelievers as opposed to what many ignorant muslims today they go there they take pictures they have uh, musical uh, festivities and a lot of nonsense that the prophet وسلم, warned us not to do and these people obviously will uh, come to receive their punishment because the Prophet وسلم, told us not to enter the land or the homes rather of the people who were destroyed lest what happened to them would happen to us. So these people that go there, take pictures, uh, uh, attend the uh, musical uh, uh, soirees and festivals, these people will get the same punishment as the people of uh, Thamud received. So the, uh, the people of Thamud were uh, in what's today called Mada in Saleh in Saudi Arabia, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was going on the Ghazwa uh, Tabuk, the for the Battle of Tabuk against the Romans, against the Roman Empire, uh, he passed by the ruins of Thamud during the ninth year of Hijrah. This is when the Battle of Tabuk uh, happened. Imam Ahmad recorded that Ibn Umar said. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the area of Al Hijr in Tabuk, when the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the area of Al Hijr in Tabuk with the people, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam camped near the homes of Tamud. He did not enter the homes of Tamud, but he camped near these homes in Al Hijr. And the people that were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought water from the wells that Tamud used before for to, to drink water from and the people used that water to make dough and place the pots on fire for cooking obviously using the same water they took from the wells of the people of Thamud however the Prophet Sallallahu commanded them to spill the contents of the pots and to give the dough to their camels uh, obviously as we will see it's because the Prophet Sallallahu said that you know, if you use their utensils, you use their water, you enter their homes, whatever happened to them will happen to you. Uh, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then marched forth further from those uh, ruins uh, to another area near a well. And he allowed them to take water from this well. Why this well it was allowed? Because this is the well where the she-camel, the miracle that Allah sent to people of Thamud, as we will see, used to drink from. So the she-camel used to drink from this well, uh, that well. Uh, was okay to use his water. He وسلم, forbade the companions from entering the area where people were tormented in general. So many people today, they go to uh, these ruins of the people that were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taking selfies, think that they're, they're just doing harmless tourism. My brothers, learn about your religion before doing anything. You want to travel anywhere, you have to learn your religion. And actually, subhanallah, subhanallah uh, I've seen this with my eyes uh, lately. A hadith the Prophet ﷺ spoke about, and 
it was happening in front of our eyes just a couple of days ago in Egypt. The Prophet ﷺ said that the hour shall not come until the butts of the ladies will uh, rush towards the statue of the Al-Khalasa. This was a statue that was being worshipped in the land of Arabia. So the Prophet ﷺ said that there's going to come a time when like women would rush and, you know, to the point, you know, basically they will uh, shove each other and push each other uh, because rushing to go see this statue. The scholar uh, Abdullah uh, Al-Qasir, may Allah preserve him, uh, explained that this will happen because the, the ignorant and the disbelievers and the hypocrites all together will bring back these old statues that used to be worshipped under the guise and the false name of uh, heritage. This is our heritage. So they, they take out these statues that used to be worshipped besides Allah, statues that are supposed to be destroyed. This is the, the Sharia ruling for every statue that exists. It has to be destroyed. Any, any statue that is worshipped besides Allah, it gets destroyed. It doesn't get put in a museum. It doesn't, you know, uh, just because, uh, you know, they just happen to discover it. Uh, and it's thousands of years old, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden this statue that is worshipped besides Allah has a greater value because this is what shaitan does and misleads people slowly into worshipping these statues, honoring them, thinking that these statues have some type of barakah, some type of, of power in them. So, so not a couple of days, but me a week late, uh, ago or something, in Egypt they discovered these uh, statues and these uh, mummies of uh, disbelieving pharaohs that were uh, buried thousands of years, and then they took them in a huge parade uh, through the uh, the streets of Egypt, uh, honoring them. I'm like, oh, subhanAllah, this is what the Prophet said. People start honoring the statues and calling that heritage. This is nonsense. This is not heritage. This belief is this belief. You can call it whatever you want to call it. And the biggest proof is that shaitan called the tree that caused Adam السلام, to be expelled from Jannah. He called it the tree of eternity. Was it really the tree of eternity? No, it was not. Similarly, this is not heritage. This is this belief. So uh, the people that were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to fear Allah and not do like them. The people of Lut, the people of Lut that were destroyed, uh, their, their their homes are buried under the Dead Sea. And many Muslims, like in the uh, Jordan and everything else, they go and, and, and bathe in this Dead Sea beaches like it's just a normal beach. When the Prophet ﷺ said that we should not bathe in, uh, we should not enter the homes, and the scholar said that because the people of uh, <laughs> the people of Lot were destroyed under uh, that uh, the Dead Sea, we should not swim in that Dead Sea. So, you know, the Muslims have to go back to the religion. They have to understand what's right, what's wrong, and not fall for every single uh, ruse and, uh, and plot that shaitan and his followers among the, immig the, the, the ignorance, the, uh, the disbelievers and hypocrites uh, plot for the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I fear that what befell these destroyed people might befall you as well. Therefore, do not answer on them. If someone says, well, why would that happen? Because the Prophet ﷺ warned you. And if you don't heed the warning, whatever happened to them will happen to you. They were destroyed, as you will see, by stones and by earthquake. You shall be destroyed the same way. This I believe because the Prophet ﷺ said it. So if you don't heed the warning, this is what's going to happen to you. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, his job is to convey the message. And it's up to you to choose. If you disbelieve in that, if you think that it's far-fetched and that's not going to happen, then you try it and you only bear the blame for the, the evil consequences, consequences, no one else. So the Prophet ﷺ said, do not enter the homes of the people that were destroyed because I fear that what befell them might befall you as well. Therefore, do not enter on them. Ahmed, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, narrated uh, that Abdullah bin Umar عنهما, said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said while in the Hijr area, Al Hijr is the, the where the people of, of Salih were. Uh, so they're also called the Ashab al Hijr. He وسلم, said, Do not enter on these who were tormented unless you do so while crying, out of humbleness, out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lest what happened to them would happen to you. If you are not crying, they do not enter on them. If you're not crying, do not enter on them. And these ignorant Muslims. They go there and have musical festivals. They take selfies, they take pictures. Do they not fear Allah? 
I, if they knew this 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 hadith and they still do what they do, this is proof that they don't really believe what the Prophet said, right? This is this is obvious. But they may be ignorant of the ruling, and the job of the call to Islam and the scholars is to show uh, the truth so that the people can avoid falling into the traps of shaitan. So he said, if you're not crying, then do not answer on them, so that what befell them does not befall you as well. لا تدخلوا على هؤلاء معذبين إلا أن تكونوا باكين فإن لم تكونوا باكين فلا تدخلوا عليهم أن يصيبكم مثل ما أصابهم. So what is the story of Prophet Saleh السلام, and his tribe of Thamud? Allah said, وإلى ثمود and to the tribe of Thamud, meaning the tribe of Thamud, we send their brother Saleh. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ He said, O oh my people, worship Allah alone. You have no other God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because every messenger that came to his people, they always called to this tawheed, monotheism of worship. You know, because this is, this is key to understanding the difference between Islam and the rest of religions. Because many Muslims, they look at the Jews, Christians, uh, uh, Hindus, Sikhs, and they say, well, everybody worships Allah, except that they call in him a different name. Well, whomever says this is an ignorant person. Because Allah says, worship him alone. Monotheism. So, worshiping Allah alone, meaning making dua to him alone, prostrating to him alone, Sacrifice to him alone, fearing him alone, and having your life and your death for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Ibrahim alayhi salam said, I don't I don't know the, the ayah correctly in Surah Al-Araf, the end of Surah Al-Araf. Jazakallah. قل إن صلاتي ونسكي ومحياي ومماتي لله رب العالمين لا شريك له وبذلك أمرت وأنا أول المسلمين. So every prophet asked their people to توحيد العبادة, the monotheism of worship. It's not توحيد الربوبية. They didn't call people to believe that there is only one Creator. Everybody believed, and everybody believed that there is one Creator, except a very small number of humanity that they call themselves uh, atheists. But even they themselves don't believe in the lies that they say about the uh, non-existence of a Creator. So uh, basically, everyone knows that there is a Creator up there. Even the Hindus that have thousands of gods, they say there is a Brahma, a God up there. You know, up there somewhere. We don't know anything about him. He's over there, and you know, if we want something, we have our own statues. You know, we have statue for uh, to have children, a statue to, to, to have rain, a statue to have money, uh, hang an amulet, this, hang a jade, jade, this, hang this thing, do that, do this, do that. If you want, if you want to get certain things, but you know, we know there is a creator up there. This is not what the prophets called the people to. They called, they did not call them to the uh, monotheism of lordship. Tawheed They called them to monotheism of worship. Tawheed uluhiya. Even the mushrikeen, the proof to this is that the mushriks, that the Prophet ﷺ called mushrik, the Prophet ﷺ fought, the Prophet ﷺ said that they're going to be in, in hellfire forever. They knew that there is Allah. The proof is in the Quran. Allah says, And if you ask these polytheists that will dwell in hellfire forever, who created the heavens and earth, they will say Allah. So they had some type of tawhid or bubiyya, the, the monotheism of lordship. But that's not, that's not what the prophets called for. The prophets called for worshiping Allah alone. That's why the mushriks, maybe the mushriks Arab, the Arab mushriks understood the message of the Prophet ﷺ more than what many of the Muslims today think about the message of Muhammad ﷺ. That's why they say, The Prophets of, of Quraysh, they said, Oh, did Prophet Muhammad ﷺ make all these gods into one single god to worship? So they knew what he وسلم, was calling to. He was calling to worshiping one God. He did not call them to believe that there is a creator up there. Otherwise, there's going to be no difference between a Jew, Christian, a Muslim, a Hindu. Everyone knows that there is a creator out there. No, it's worshiping Allah alone. This is the message of all the prophets. Worship Allah alone. So all Allah's messengers called to the worship of Allah alone without partners. That's why Allah said in another ayah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ And we did not send any messenger before you, O Muhammad وسلم, except that we revealed to this messenger to tell him 
uh, revealed to this messenger to tell his people that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. So worship Allah. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَجَتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ And verily we have sent among every ummah a messenger proclaiming to them, worship Allah alone and avoid taghut. All that is worshipped besides Allah is called taghut. Avoid everything that is worshipped besides Allah, worship Allah alone. So this is the core uh, message of the of Prophet Muhammad and all the prophets before him, that is to worship Allah alone. Now the Tham people of Thamud obviously ask their prophet for a miracle so that he can prove to them that he's telling the truth. So they asked him that a she-camel appear from a stone and they asked him that this she-camel would be nine months pregnant, that she be huge in size, that she be red color. So they were telling him descriptions that they thought is impossible to, to, make, uh, to make true. So, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them what they asked for and still they disbelieved. That's why the Prophet Salih said, قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ بَيْهِنَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ هَذِهِ نَاقَةُ اللَّهِ لَكُمْ آيَةٌ Indeed, there has come to you a clear sign from your Lord. What you actually asked for, this is the she-camel of Allah, that is a sign unto you. Meaning, the she-camel is a miracle that has come to you from Allah, testifying to the truth of what I came to you with, because he asked me for a miracle, and I produced this miracle for you. Saleh's people asked him to produce a miracle and suggested, suggested a certain solid rock that they chose. So there was a rock over there in the town. They told him we want the, the, uh, the she-camel to come out from this rock. So they were very specific about some things, right? And this rock stood lonely in the area of Al-Hijr, and which was called Al-Katiba. So they asked him to bring a pregnant camel out of that stone. So Saleh took their covenant and promises that if Allah answers their challenge, they should believe and follow him. Otherwise, punishment will befall them. So they gave him their oaths and promises to that. And Saleh started praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to produce that miracle. All of a sudden, the stone, this al-katiba that they wanted a, a, a she-camel to come out of, this stone moved and broke apart, effectively producing a she-camel with thick wool. It was pregnant, and its fetus was visibly moving in its belly. So they asked him for this camel to be nine months pregnant, and they saw this she-camel give birth in front of their eyes so that he can prove to them that it's not magic. So this is exact. So he pr produced the miracle exactly as his people asked, and this is when their chief, Jundu bin Amr, and several others followed Salih alayhi salam. They believed in the in the in the miracle. However, the rest of the noblemen of Thamud wanted to believe as well, but there was this guy Duab bin Amr bin Labid al Habab, who tended their idols. This guy was was worried that he would lose his job. You know, his job was to tend the idols. And there was also Rabab bin Sum'ar bin Jilhis. And both of these stopped these other chiefs and noblemen from believing in Thamud. So, you know, there's always this uh, rotten apple in the society that always stops people from doing what's, what's right. So one of the cousins of Jundu bin Amr, whose name was Shihab, Bin Khalifa, Bin Mikhlat, Bin Labid, Bin Jawas was one of the leaders of Thamud. And he also wanted to accept the message. However, the chiefs whom we mentioned before prevented him. You know, this uh, uh, Al-Habbab and also Rabbab. So Al-Habbab and Rabbab, they, they stopped them from accepting the message. So the camel remained in Thamud as well as its offspring after she delivered it before them in front of their eyes so that they, you know, they can't claim that it's magic. The camel used to drink from its well. There was a well where the camel used to drink from on one day and leave the well for Tamud the next day because she was so big, so huge. She would drink alone from that well on one day. And during that day, the people of Tamud would not drink from that well, but they would be able to milk her. And on the following day, she would not drink from that well, and the people of Thamud could basically uh, drink and store water in their containers for the following day where they're not allowed to drink from the well. 
That's why Allah SWT said in another ayah, وَنَبِّئْهُمْ أَنَّ الْمَاءَ قِسْمَةٌ بَيْنَهُمْ كُلُّ شِرْبٍ مُحْتَضَرٌ And inform them that the water is to be shared between the she-camel and them. Each one's right to drink being established by turns. One day for the camel, one day for the people. And also Allah SWT says similarly, هَذِهِ نَاقَةٌ لَهَا شِرْبٌ وَلَكُمْ شِرْبُ يَوْمٍ مَعْلُومٌ here is a she camel. It has a right to drink water, and you have a right to drink water each on a specific day. So the camel used to graze in some of their valleys, going through a pass, a pass that's between mountains, and coming out through another pass. She did that so that as to be able to move easily because she used to drink a lot of water. She was a tremendous animal. She was huge because they asked for her to be a huge animal, so no bigger than normal, right? And she also had a strikingly beautiful appearance. When she used to pass by their cattle, the cattle would be afraid of her because of her, her sheer size. So when this matter continued for a long time, and Thamuz's rejection of Saleh became intense, they intended to kill the camel so that they could take the water for themselves every day. I mean, look at this idiocy. They, they have water from this well one day, and the following day they have a lot of milk, free milk. There was also other wells that they could take water from, as we saw from the, the, uh, the, the previous hadith. But still, shaitan came to them, telling them that this well is the well where they need to drink from every day. So, you see, sometimes this is the plot of shaitan. He makes something that is worthless seem like it's the world. So, they said, you know what? She is bothering us. We're going to kill her so that we can drink the water every day from that well and have all the water for ourselves. And of course, they're going to lose the milk. So which one is more important for them, milk or water? Obviously, it's milk because they had other sources of water. So it was said that all of them, the disbelievers of Tamud, conspired to kill the camel. Qatada said that he was told that the designated killer of the camel approached them all. So the, the person who's going to kill the camel approached every single one of the tribe, including women in their rooms and children. And he found out that all of them agreed to kill her. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. He did not do injustice to them because each and every single one of them condoned this evil act. That's why they deserve the punishment. So when you condone an evil act, you deserve the punishment in Allah's book, even if you did not make it. And there are hadiths to testify to that. One of them is a person who is poor. And he says, if I had the money that such and such person has, I would have committed such and such evil. This person does not have that money. He's not able to commit this evil, but he takes the sin for it. Why? Because his intention is to commit that sin. The only reason why he's not committing the sin is because he's unable to. Not because he does not want to. His intention is to commit the sin. So everyone agreed that the she camel should, should be killed. This fact is apparent from the word of the ayah. فَكَذَّبُوهُ فَعَقَرُوهَا فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَّاهَا وَلَا يَخَافُ عُقَبَاهَا Then they denied Salih alayhi salam and they killed the she-camel. So their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah destroyed them because of their sin and made them equal in destruction. We explained why. Because even the ones who did not kill the camel, they condoned that action, so they shared in the sin of the killing. Also, Allah SWT said, وَآتَيْنَا ثَمُودًا بَصِرَةً فَظَلَمُوا بِهَا And we sent the she-camel to Thamud as a clear sign, but they did her wrong. They did her no justice, they did her wrong. Why? They killed her. They killed her. Therefore, these ayats stated that the entire tribe, the entire tribe shared in agreeing to this crime, and Allah knows best. And that's why we have to understand that when you have some disbelieving societies where laws are enacted against Islam and Muslims, people in that society that agree with that law, even if they are not the ones who enacted those laws, they share a similar sin. Like today in France, they are disallowing. Uh, girls who are less than 18 years old to wear hijab. They call this woman's freedom. I mean, excuse me. You're stopping, stopping, underline this word, stopping a woman of dressing the way she wants. And then you call this freedom. This is hypocrisy and idiocy. So you tell the woman she has the right to get naked, be naked in the street. 
she has the right to be homosexual. As she does not have the right to cover her hair, she does not have the right to cover her face, she does not have the right to get close to her Lord. What kind of idiocy is this that you are calling freedom? Now, obviously, the society, the member of society that condone these laws are similar and equal in sin. We have to understand that. And of course, for the Muslims that live in those societies, they really have to look in the mirror and ask themselves, am I a Muslim or am I not a Muslim? If someone is going to come and tell me that my daughter is not allowed to wear the hijab according to her Lord's action, then I have to ask myself, do I worship these people and I worship their laws or do I worship Allah? If you say you worship Allah, then you definitely should not stay there. You Hijrah becomes compulsory on you if you are able to do so. And when we say you're able to do so, it doesn't mean that you have to have a castle in a Muslim land for you to say, I don't have the means to make Hijrah. If you're able to pick up your, your, your belongings, pick up your family and leave, then it is a sin on you if you stay in that land of disbelief. France is also disallowing halal meat. Is, is, is actually disallowing slaughtering animal according to Allah's law. So a Muslim is going to become a vegetarian or eat haram meat. And he's going to say, well, darura, I'm compulsed. No, my brother, there's no darura. The land of Islam is so huge, mashallah. If one country is bad, the, ten countries are better. And, and even the Muslim countries, there are in varying degree of adherence to Sharia. So you can't say it's the same. Don't lie to yourself. Don't let shaitan mislead you. Muslim countries today have a lot of problems, but the problems that are happen, that happen in Muslim countries today, they're usually worldly, dunya problems. Dunya problems, it's nothing. No one in the Muslim country tells you, your wife is not allowed to wear niqab, your, your daughter is not allowed to wear hijab. So you can't tell me that they are the same. If you tell me they're the same, you are lying to yourself, my brother. I ask Allah for me and my brothers to see the correct way and do what is correct because if we continue on this path we are afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace us by other people as he subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah does not need us the religion does not need us we need Allah we need the religion if we don't take the torch of this religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace us by other people and who's the loser it's us we're gonna lose Thamud kills the shikamu Imam Abu Ja'far ibn Jarir and other scholars of Tafsir said that the reason behind killing the camel was that a disbelieving old woman, among them named Um, um Ghanim, Unayza, the daughter of Ghanim bin Mijlaz, had the severest enmity among Thamud towards Saleh. <coughs> Peace be upon him. So this old disbelieving woman, whose name was Um Ghanim, she had the, the, the severest enmity among Thamud towards Salih alayhi salam. So, and she also had beautiful daughters. The tool of shaitan. Mislead men through women. So she had beautiful daughters and she was wealthy. And also Du'ab bin Amr, one of the leaders of Thamud, was her husband. There was another noble woman. So here the story of the two uh, evil women that actually uh, convinced the, some evil doers to kill the the, uh, the, sh the she camel. There was another noble woman whose name was Saduf bin Tal Muhayya, bin Dahr bin Al Muhayya, who was also of a noble family, wealthy and beautiful. So she was wealthy and beautiful. She was married married to a man who became a Muslim from Tamud, but she left him because she's a disbeliever. She didn't like the fact that her husband became Muslim. So these two women, out of their animosity to the religion. Of Allah and to the Prophet of Allah uh, Saleh alayhi salam, they offer the prize for those who swore to them that they would kill the camel. So the first one, Saduf, summoned a man called Al Habbab and she offered herself in zina to him if he would kill the camel. So, like I said, an evil woman is the biggest tool of shaitan, a pious woman is the biggest enemy of shaitan because if you have a pious woman, she orders her husband to do what's right, she orders her children to do what's right, and she can be the biggest enemy of shaitan and the biggest tool against shaitan. Similarly, if the woman is opposite of that, then she is the biggest helper of shaitan against herself, her husband, and her family as a whole. So she offered herself in zina to this person if he would call, kill the camel, but he refused. So she called another cousin of hers, whose name was Musaddi' Musaddi' or Musaddi' bin Mihraj bin al-Muhayya and he agreed 
he agreed to come in dinner with her and kill the camel. You know, small worldly benefit for a huge sin that will cause the destruction of a whole tribe. As for Hunayza bint Ghanim, the first one, the one who had beautiful daughters, she called another evil person in the tribe named Qudar bin Salif bin Jundu, who was number one, a short person with red blue skin. He was also a bastard, according to them. And obviously, you know, a bastard is a person in Islam, a bastard should not be the leader of the people. Now, someone may ask, well, what's his sin? It's his parents that committed zina. It's true. His parents committed zina, and he was incubated through an evil sperm. It was not through the, uh, the wedlock, the halal wedlock. Therefore, it is an evil sperm that formed in the womb of his mother. So if he is biased, if he obeys Allah, he will enter Jannah. He will not enter hellfire because he is the son of, of zina. But he cannot be the leader of the people. He cannot be an imam. He cannot lead the people in salat unless there is no one else to lead the people. So we do. We should not take this thing lightly. You know what some Muslims do? They have boyfriend. They are boyfriends and girlfriends, and they wait until the the girl gets pregnant, and then he gets married to her. He says that's it. Nothing. Nothing wrong happened. No, my son. We don't. We, this is not Islam. We don't commit zina and after that we say, okay, you know what? Now we're gonna get married. Now some scholars say that the marriage is correct. The son. Uh, inherits from his uh, from his father, uh, but there is difference of opinion. In any event, we are saying this so that we can discourage the youth from following this path of uh, of committing zina, thinking that there is no harm as long as they get married later. No, there is huge harm because a son of zina cannot be the leader of the people. So this Qudar was a son of zina. He's a bastard. That's why he was evil. And usually, bastards are evil by nature. Okay, and you can see that in the Western societies where they rejected the teachings of Isa alayhi salam, the teachings of Musa alayhi salam, and they, they legalized uh, uh, having children out of wedlock. They encouraged that by several means. You see that many of them are bastards, many of them are killers, many of them are evildoers. This is the sunnah of Allah and His creation. Allah give the law, whomever obeys the law thrives in this world and in the hereafter. Whomever disbelieves in this law and rejects it suffers in this world and in the hereafter. So this Qudar was a bastard. He was evil. He was not the son of his claimed father Salif, but he was the son of another man called Suhaid, who had committed zina with the mother of Qudar. Uh, however, he was born on Salif's bed and thus he was named after him. Now, Unayza said to Qudar, I will give you any of my beautiful daughters that you wish if you kill the camel. So this Qudar bin Salif and Musaddiq bin Mihraj, the, the cousin of the, the second lady, went along and rec recruited several other mischievous persons from Thamud to kill the camel. Seven more agreed. And the group became how many? Nine. And these nines are the ones that are described in Allah's ayah when he says, وَكَانَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ تِسَعَةُ يُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يُصْلِحُونَ and there were in the city of Thamud uh, nine men who made mischief in the land and would not reform. The two we saw them, Qudar and uh, uh, Qudar and uh, Musaddiq, and they recruited seven other evil people. So these nine men were the chiefs of evil among their people, and they lured the entire tribe into agreeing to kill the camel. So they waited until the camel left the water well where she used to drink from where Qudar waited beside the rock on its path while Musaddiq waited at another rock so wait because the, the camel was big and huge and tall so they had to go to a higher uh, to a higher level in order for them to be able to reach her neck so when the camel passed by Musaddiq he shot an arrow at her and the arrow pierced her leg pierced her leg at that time Runeza came out and ordered her daughter, this is one of the two evil women, she ordered her daughter, who was among the most beautiful women, to do what? To uncover her face for Qudar, so that Qudar can be encouraged to kill, because all of a sudden he sees this beautiful girl. And guess what? She ordered her to do what? Uncover her face. So that means even at the time, covering the face was Allah's law, and was the norm among mankind, covering the woman's face. Because the woman's beauty is where? It's in the face. When a person wants to get married to the woman and he wants to do another shara'iyah, the shara'i, look, what does he do? Does he go and look at her hands, or her legs? No, he looks at her face. 
So if her face is supposed to be shown to everyone in the street, why does he have to go to her father's house to see her? So this in itself is also proof that covering the face is mandatory for, for women. So in any event, this beautiful woman uncovered her face for Qudar, so he was mesmerized by her, uh, by her beauty, and that encouraged him to go further in his, in his uh, evil act without hesitation, and he swung his sword, hitting the camel on her knee. So she fell to the ground, the camel fell to the ground and screamed once to warn her offspring. Also another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that this evil person, Qudar, when he saw the camel, he was scared of her. So what did he do? He drank alcohol. Because when he drank alcohol, he no longer had that reasoning or logic of fear. You know, a person who's drunk, he goes and says, I'm going to jump from this uh, twin tower. He's not scared because he's drunk. His, his mind is gone. So he jumps and then he commits suicide. I actually met a person like this. A while back, and he specifically told me that you know one night he he was in Niagara Falls and he got drunk and then he was not he was a non-Muslim because we were discussing the fact that you know a person when he gets drunk he may fornicate with his own mother with his own daughter because he doesn't know what he's doing, and he told me yeah one one day I was in Niagara Falls and you know I was drunk and and then I stood on the edge of Niagara Falls and I and I thought that I was gonna be able to fly, you know but somehow Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did not allow him to jump, but. Basically, that's one of the evil of drinking alcohol. And this is why we always say that if something had goodness in it, Allah would not have forbidden it for his slaves because Allah always allows what is good for his slaves, what is good for them in their health, in their soul, in this world, in the hereafter. Whatever is haram is not good for us. So we should not follow the, uh, the filth of the mind of the uh, non-believers or hypocrites or ignorant that try to tell you that something haram is actually good for you. So in any event, uh, the beautiful woman covered her face, uh, plus Qudar got drunk, so he had no more fear. He swung his sword, he hit the camel on her knee, she fell to the ground and screamed once to warn her offspring to run away. Qudar stabbed, stabbed her in her neck and slaughtered her. Her offspring uh, went up a high rock and screamed. Abdul Razak recorded from Ma'mar that someone reported from Al-Hassan al-Basri, the offspring said, Oh my Lord, where is my mother? It was also said that her offspring screamed thrice and entered the rock and vanished in it. Some scholars said that Adabba, the animal that is mentioned in Surah Al-Naml that will come uh, after the sun rises from the west and, uh, you know, it has, it's going to have the staff of, of uh, Musa alayhi salam and the, uh, and the ring of uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam and will stamp the people on their foreheads this is a believer this is a disbeliever some of the scholars said this is actually the uh, the baby camel of the she camel that went inside the rock he, that's the actual uh, animal that will come back out at the uh, end times Allah knows best so when they finished the camel off and the news reached prophet Saleh alayhi salam he came to them while they were gathered, obviously they ate from the meat of the camel. When he saw the camel, he cried and proclaimed, Enjoy yourselves in your homes for three days, because that's it, Allah's punishment is coming to you. So the wicked ones, after that, plotted to kill Prophet ﷺ himself. But then Allah saved him and the torment descended on them. The nine wicked people killed the camel on a Wednesday. And that night, they conspired to kill Saleh. They said, if he is truthful, that we will die after three days, then we should finish him off before we are finished. We should kill him before dying. Look at them. Even if they are dying, they, instead of repent, repenting, they want to commit more evil because they are pure evil people. But if he is a liar, then we will make him follow his camel. That's why Allah mentioned this in the Quran saying, they said, swear to one another by Allah. Look, they swore by Allah. That we shall make a secret night attack on him and his household. So because we said that the polytheists did not reject the existence of Allah, or that they swear by him, or they sacrifice for him. But did they also do these things for other 
statues, other so-called gods besides Allah. This is polytheism, shirk. So it doesn't mean that they negated the existence of Allah or his power. It's just that they joined others in the worship, in their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they said, swear to one another by Allah that we shall make a secret night attack on him and his household. That means kill Salih alayhi salam and his family. And thereafter will surely say to his near relatives, his uh, uh, extended family members, we, we did not witness the destruction of his household and verily we are telling the truth. Why? So that the extended family of Salih alayhi salam does not uh, ask for retaliation against these evil people. So they said, let's kill Salih and his, and his uh, immediate family and tell his extended family that we did not know what happened to them. So they plotted a plot and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also planned a plot while they perceived not. When they conspired to kill Salih and gather that night to carry out their plot, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to whom belongs all might and who protects his messengers, rained down stones that smashed the heads of these nine people before the rest of the tribe. So these nine people uh, received their punishment first. That was Wednesday night. On Thursday, the first of the three days of respite, the people woke up and their faces were pale yellow, just as Prophet Saleh had promised them. On the second day of respite, which is a Friday, they woke up and found their faces had turned red. On the third day of respite, Saturday, they woke up with their faces black. On Sunday, they wore the fragrance of Hanot. They knew they were going to die that day. So they, they put the perfume for inch round in the dead before they get buried because they knew that they were going to be uh, killed and destroyed. And they awaited Allah's torment and revenge. We took refuge with Allah from Allah's torment and revenge. They did not know how they were going to be taken. They did not know what would be done to them or how and from where the torment would come. But when the sun rose, the sayha, a loud cry, came from the sky, Jibreel alayhi salam. One single loud cry kills them all. And a severe tremor, earthquake, overtook them from below them. And the souls were captured and the bodies became lifeless all in an hour. And as Allah explained, they explained described their state in the Quran and they lay dead prostrate in their homes they became dead and lifeless and none among them were the young old male or female escaped the torment why did also the women and children get the the torment because they also agreed to this evil plot they also agreed to this evil plot the scholars of tafsir said that none from the offspring of Tamud remained, except Prophet Saleh and those who believed in him. Only their progeny remained from the tribe of Tamud. A disbelieving man who was from Tamud was called Abu Rigal. At the time of the destruction of his people, he was in the sacred area, the Haram, Kaaba, the area around the Kaaba. And the torment that befell his people did not touch him. Why? Because he was in the sacred area. But once he went out of the sacred area one day, a stone fell from the sky and killed him, the same way his people were killed. Abdul Razak narrated that Ma'mar said that Ismail bin Umayyah said that the Prophet ﷺ passed by the grave site of Abu Rigal and asked the companions if they knew whose grave it was. They said, Allah and his messenger know better. So he ﷺ said, Atadruna man hadha qalu allahu wa rasooluhu a'lam. Qal hadha qabru Abi Rigal. رجل من ثمود كان في حرم الله فمنعه حرم الله عذاب الله فلما خرج أصابه ما أصاب قومه فدفنها هنا ودفن معه غصن من ذهب فنزل القوم فابتدروه بأسيافهم فبحثوا عنه فاستخرج الغصن This is the grave of Abu Rigal, a man from Thamud. He was in the sacred area of Allah and this, the fact that he was in the sacred area saved him from receiving Allah's torment. But once he went out of the sacred area, what befell his people also befell him. He was buried here along with a branch made from gold. So the people used their swords and looked for the golden branch and found it and they took it out. So this person, Abu Rigal, uh, the, uh, the, uh, The, the, uh, this Abu Rigal was from the tribe of Tamud, but he was not with them, and he was in a sacred area, and that saved them from 
the immediate destruction, but once he left the sacred area, he was destroyed. Abdul Razak narrated that Ma'mar said that Zuhri said that Abu Rigal is the father of the tribe of Thaqif. This Abu Rigal actually has a progeny, and that's the tribe of Thaqif. Because it was uh, very customary back then that a person would have uh, many wives in different areas of, of the land, in different tribes. Because sometimes, as uh, is explained in the Sira of the Prophet, you know, people would be traveling and long travel, and maybe. Uh, it would take them a month to reach their destination and sometimes when they reach the destination they, they they find the need that they need to get married they get married they have progeny there and it was a normal thing to do back then so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, about uh, Salih alayhi salam فَتَوَلَّا عَنْهُمْ وَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ لَقَدْ أَبْلَغْتُكُمْ رِسَالَةَ رَبِّي وَنَصَحْتُ لَكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُحِبُّونَ النَّاصِحِينَ then Salih turned away from his people and said oh my people i have indeed conveyed to you the message of my lord and have given you a good advice but you do not like good advisors these are the words of admonish admonishment that salih conveyed to his people after allah destroyed them for defying him rebelling against him refusing to accept the truth avoiding guidance and preferring his guidance instead even though they saw the miracles in front of their eyes Saleh said these words of admonishment and criticism to them after they perished. And they heard him as a miracle uh, for Prophet Saleh alayhi salam, which is similar to what happened to the Prophet sallam, when he spoke to the dead among the mushriks in uh, Badr. And they, they, heard, they heard him as a miracle from Allah to him. Uh, similarly, it's recorded in Sahih that after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defeated disbelievers in the Battle of Badr, he Sallallahu Alaihi remained in that area for three days and then rode his camel, which was prepared for him during the latter part of the night. He went on until he stood by the well of Badr, where the corpses of disbelievers were thrown. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Aba Jahl ibn Hisham, Ya Aba Jahl ibn Hisham, Ya Utbat ibn Rabi'ah, Ya Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah, Wa Ya Fulan ibn Fulan, Hal wajadtum ma wa'ada rabbukum haqq? فإني وجدت ما وعدني ربي حقا وأبو جهل بن هشام وعتبة بن ربيعة وشيبة بن ربيعة Do you find Did you find what your Lord has promised you of torment and punishment to be true? Because I found what my Lord has promised me of victory to be true. So Umar al asked the Prophet ﷺ, or Allah's Messenger, why do you speak to people who have rotted? They've been dead for three days. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ مَا أَنْتُمْ بِأَسْمَعَ لِمَا أَقُولِ by he in whose hand is my soul you do not hear what I am saying better than they do but they cannot reply similarly Prophet Saleh peace be upon him said to his people I have indeed conveyed to you the message of my Lord and have given you good advice but you did not benefit from it because you do not like the truth and do not follow those who give you sincere advice but you do not like good advice advisors we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us the beneficial knowledge we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people that listen to the warnings and heed the warnings and understand Allah's messages and uh, signs we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure to cure the sick among us and to have mercy on the dead among us we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, save us from all trials and tribulations and finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah al-Firdaus al-Uliya. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.